Bracken, we're recording at an unusual day and time today. Yes, we are. It feels foreign. And Race Brain didn't happen yesterday. So Race Brain happened early this morning. Rich is still in Nice. So uh, today is a day we never record, and instead I have two recordings today. Life is coming down on you, Bracken. But we had to get Just it in. It's all we- out of sorts. You have a camping weekend and a racing weekend with the family and then Braden. I have a four-day wedding extravaganza for my wife's brother. We both leave tomorrow morning, and so this is our slot. This is it. Is what it is. But Kirk, I have an update. Okay. For all those who lived through this squirrel escapade with me, mm-hmm. since that day, and then the following afternoon when I... We got the final squirrel we thought out of there and then nailed it back shut and closed, sealed it off. We have not had a single squirrel noise now for 48 hours. Well, you've either murdered them personally with your hands or they drank enough of your poison <laughs> to die a slow and painful death in your attic. So it's no, taken no, care no. of. <laughs> well, good. I think they're all out. I really do. I don't think any squirrels died. What our listeners don't know, and this is all behind the scenes, that Bracken and I hop on, we chat for a few minutes before we actually hit the record button, and I'm going to say for two months, Bracken and I's conversations start with the squirrels, the new squirrel update, and so we hadn't brought this to you until (sighs) this last week when it all came together during our recording, but um, this has been a long time coming, so I'm very happy for you and the squirrels, maybe. Thank you. And and their main point of entry exit before it was taken away from them is up in the corner of the eaves of our house, which is directly above where I sit. Mm. So when they're nine, it's just going straight down into this space right here. And it's very loud. And then they got through uh, the two by sixes and were up on the metal flashing. And so it sounded like someone hitting like a chisel against metal the last this past week. They were just trying to work through the metal, so it was so loud, but it was directly above me, and it was very hard to focus. Sounds like it would be very hard to focus, and it was very hard for you to focus. We got them. For a while. Well, good. We can put that to rest until well, Especially some... once they started dropping out of the <laughs> ceiling right outside my door. That's how you know you have an older house built at least pre-60s, 60s or earlier, probably earlier than that. What is your house? Yeah. Ni- well, there's, there's some debate either 1918 or like 1922 okay well the debate doesn't matter it's over 100 years old that happens in houses either like way that. it's 100 years <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well there you go i wanted to pose a question to you so today folks we are going to wrap up the q a questions that we didn't get to in our last friday episode um and because of our busy weeks we're not going to give you a true like hour and a half or two hour long run episode we're going to give you a 60 to 75 minutes so hopefully you have a shorter run planned for yourself this Saturday. And if not, you're just going to have to listen to another podcast to finish it out. We understand. Um, but okay. So I want to update the listeners real quick. Two weeks ago, we had a convert, no, a week and a half ago, we had a conversation about me laying an egg in a workout. The heat got to me. I didn't perform, started to lose potential hope of my A goal in this upcoming half marathon, which is just over a week from the time you're listening to this. Of course, I knew it was, you know, you're not out of shape, you're tired, right? Like that is what I preach to my athletes. Like they have a bad day and they've been training consistently. You didn't magically fall out of shape. You're just tired. Let yourself charge back up. And I did that for the most part. Took the back half of the week easier, reset expectations with a quality day, held back on my long run to make it like a recovery pacing long run. And my legs came around. I had a great workout on Tuesday, one week after I completely, you know, bonked, we will call it. And so... I'm starting to set expectations for this race, Grandma's Half Marathon, and mm-hmm. I want to know what you're honest, uh, not biased. I don't, I don't know how the workout I did Tuesday translate. I can't quite decide. And even though I would easily be able to look at an athlete's metrics from this workout and say, yep, you're ready to run this, okay. I could do it for somebody else, but I think I need to consult in you for this. Well, hit me with it. And these are the conversations I'm you pulling folks. up a calculator to, to try something out okay. as well. And folks, these are the conversations Bracken and I had before we started recording the podcast. He'd call me up and we'd talk about something. And this is something we would do before 
we even started this. So let's just have it out on air. So I did a mile repeat workout yesterday, Tuesday. We're recording early. Um, five by a mile, two minutes rest on the track. Okay. 10 to 12 mile an hour winds. They, you know, help you and hurt you. Whatever. I added some quarters and twos at the end. Those don't really matter. So for the effort, I averaged somewhere around 502, 503, 502, 503. Okay. And I finished in 457. It was like 507, 505, 505, 503, 457, something like that. Averages out. I held back but worked with purpose. And I didn't over rev this time. I said I'm gonna I'm gonna work hard but not overextend. And I found out I had 29 second 200s in me at the end of all that, which I ran two of them and felt pretty good about, which I haven't done in a while. So you take that and you project that out a week and a half, and you say, okay, if you average, let's say it's 503 average. I don't know what it was. 503 average for five by a mile with two minutes rest. Does that equate to being able to run 13 miles consecutively? 17 seconds slower per mile. Does that math math or does that math not math? This is the toughest type of math to do. Toughest type of math. That's why I'm so, consulting. When you first said five by mile with two minutes rest, uh, and then you did some work after, my thought was if you were able to do work after, which means you didn't go to the well on these, I would need to see at least sub 510 to be able to say you have a shot at a 70 minute half. So to hear that you won 503, which I believe is like 1545 5k shape, 1525 k shape equates to like 110 high, 110 40 or something like that. The equivalent performance, 15, what you did last year, uh, 1517, I believe, mm -hmm. um, if you did the, your heat conversion, which we are not even going to do, let's just say 1517 converts to like 110 flat. So yeah. an equivalent performance to that 5k would say that you can run a 70 minute half marathon right now. You just average 1545 pace, which would say you can run probably closer to 113 to 115. Mm -hmm. So that's the range I'm going to give you is 70 to 75 minutes is your window. It's a big window. And it's a big window because your workout would say, yeah, I think you can run like a 72 off that. Mm -hmm. But I also know that two minutes rest is long for you. And I don't know really how much it costs you, but you close in 450, what, six, seven? Seven flat, roughly. Almost, I think it was almost four. Yeah, so there's confounding variables here. Five by mile in no way, shape, or form can give us confidence to predict a half marathon. Correct. But I think your window is 70 to 75, which means if you pace out going at like six, 73, it gives you the the ability to work down and still get to 70 or bite your teeth and hang on and still be 74, 75. So that's my non-math, mathy prediction slash recommendation. I know that is the range. I, I'm confident that is the range. Right. It's, it's, I didn't tell you anything you didn't know. No, it's it's more, and you guys listening can understand, especially road athletes, which I've been embracing recently, is if your goal is to run 520s, but you run mile one and two at 525, 525, that's 10 seconds to make up. Can you really run 515, 515 to offset that? Like then you're gonna just lose that battle. You're not gonna be able to make it up. So the question mm -hmm. becomes, do you risk it all early? And if you implode completely and run 117 because you were on 520 pace through eight miles and then the wheels fell off, like is that worth the risk? Or do you run your first conservatively, right? And know that you're going to have a decent mm -hmm. finish. That's always the battle, right? So I haven't been in this position yeah. much recently. I think we have to take our own advice here, which is that you can always close down a distance race. True. I mean, even like my 5K PR, I ran 502 average, but closed in 450. Right, right. Had I gone out in 450, I would not have averaged 502. 
And we look at the 10Ks that have been run and the half marathons and the marathons, even though the math doesn't make logical sense that if I go out five seconds per mile slow to start, I have to then go five seconds per mile faster than goal pace later. That's not going to work. That is the way our bodies work. Mm -hmm. Starting at even 530 and then 525 sets you up better to hold 520, I think, than 520 does because you just ease into it. And the first feels so easy compared to going out right at what doesn't necessarily feel easy. So I do believe you have to build yourself a negative split buffer rather than a hold on. I think 70 minutes is too long. It's too long to go out at pace for unless you get on the back of a great pace group that's running 520s and you hang on the back mm -hmm. and instead of picking it up you just pass each person that falls off it that's my only way i would go out at 520 is if you had a herd of people at 520 and you got to start out as last person well i will be starting out as last person because i didn't i don't have a qualifying time for the pro wave so i will go with the masses which happens seconds after the pro wave goes off um I've run fast enough to get in, but I don't have a USATF certified two. I need two certified races. Mm -hmm. They won't take my race results from the 5K. They won't take it. So I'm running with the masses, um, which is kind of exciting. So I'll be coming from behind. But we can move on in a second. But I'm very glad I just asked you because I wasn't going to like take our time on the podcast to discuss this with you. But I needed to hear that, that buffer and negative splitting being the right call. That's your insurance policy. <laughs> um, starting with your backup plan and always charging home feels a lot better than the opposite. And I think you're right. I think, I think you're going to do it. You're going to finish your strongest. You're not going to finish your weakest. If I'm going to run it, I'm going to run my last few miles my fastest, not the opposite. And maybe kick home yeah. in something faster than I thought I was capable of and take a bigger chunk of time off and make it make it happen so i think i needed that so thank you maybe i'll the go to a little slower you start the slower you start the less likely you are to run your best pace for the whole thing but the more likely you are to miss by a small window like mm -hmm. if you get done you're like oh i went out a little too slow you're gonna be talking 30 to 60 seconds off your best you could have done and if you go on at or above then your window could be three to four minutes at the end and mm -hmm. not really knowing what it is. And so I understand why like 70 minutes, since it's on the verge of doable, I believe you could, but it's right on the edge. You got to nail it to get it. Uh, and so if in a one-off situation, yeah, I'd promote just going for it. But I look at this like this is number one, your first resume line for your next race you have to enter. Yeah. So I don't think you want to run a 77. I think you want to run a, set yourself up to run low 70s and see what happens. Maybe you get hot. Yeah. Good. I haven't, I haven't worn my super shoes, the, my favorite, the ones that I'm fastest. I've kept them away from these workouts. So we have the magic of that as well. Good. And the taper. Those are going to be just shiny new objects to put on my feet. But, um, okay, that's good. I, I got a lot out of that actually thinking because I've been really – not stressing, I'm not stressing over this at all, but more just like really starting to battle in my head, like what's realistic and what's the smartest approach. And when you're looking at seconds, it needs to be calculated on the roads. It just does, right? You need to feel it out, but you also need to look at your watch mm -hmm. and see what you want to see. And so, um, all right, should we, uh, I don't want to take up too much time on this. So thanks for entertaining that Bracken and folks. Should we get to our Q and A questions that we have left? Yeah, but because this is going to affect other people, not just you, I think it is worth me adding my final piece to this. And that is that the freedom of starting a little slower doesn't stop or doesn't only affect your energy stores. It affects your mental state. Mm -hmm. Going in knowing I'm going to go out at a pace and bite down and I'm not sure, that's a stressful mindset to be in. And knowing I'm going to start out a little easy and build it takes a little bit of the race anxiety away from it. And in a long race like that, that little bit of anxiety leading up does a lot to your physical state as well. So I think that giving yourself that buffer zone isn't just a physical thing either. I think that it's going to relax your whole race morning and keep you running smooth and easy rather than trying to work early on. I think you're right. 
I think you're right. I, you know, I've just I've swung and missed twice in the 5K on the track, trying to break 15 minutes. Fell 17 seconds short in some tough conditions. Mm-hmm. And those races, I went out on pace. That second mm-hmm. one in particular, I was on until I wasn't. I don't know mm-hmm. how, how that plays into this, but I didn't. I was proud of the effort because I did everything I could, but was it the smartest approach? I don't know. And I've been conservative in races in history, and this is the first time in recent years where I'm trying to grab something by the balls and tell it who's boss, right? Like yep. the body does what it is told, and I've told it yep. to do so. Now, falling short, whether it's a fool's dream, I'm setting these big A goals, or it just wasn't the right day with the right conditions. But it's an interesting little phase I'm in because it's always been about on the trails and OCR, feeling it out, like understanding your body, listening to cues and ebbing and flowing with the hills and obstacles and understanding when to press and when to conserve. But when you're threading the needle, it's not that if you're at the upper end of your abilities. Right. So it's just an interesting conversation for me. All right. We're going to pause for one second. Lisa we are. knows I'm recording. She's calling. So give me a sec. Okay. Do I have to fill the air here okay. again? Well, let's listen to the conversation, folks. Seven currently, but I'm on a podcast. Sorry, I thought you might need some. All right, love you. Bye. <laughs> nope, nothing this, pressing. This isn't our normal recording time. She gets a free pass. Oh, Lisa, she gets a free pass. So, um, what was I going to say? Oh, the the last thing with that is that making it three quarters of the way through a five k and then holding on and trying not to bleed out means two to three laps. Making it three quarters of the way through 13 miles <laughs> means you have a 5K to hold on for. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only difference there. That's like those margins get really big. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to process. And it's funny because I would probably. That being said. Yeah. If you find yourself on a 520 pace group, I don't in any way, shape, or form. Uh, think it's a bad choice if you end up just latching on and saying going for it mm-hmm. yeah i don't it's so funny because as coaches like i would have probably told my athlete the exact same thing you just told me maybe verbatim we're oddly alike that way with our recommendations bracken and i have very similar philosophies and outlooks but when it's your own self feeling your own body feeling out the pacing looking through your own eyes living your own life it's like the one thing you can't see is yourself is e- clearly Right. And so it's just an interesting position to be giving advice normally. But then like when it comes to you, you're like, huh, I don't know. It's just like kind of an oxymoronic way to go through this all. But all right, let's not dwell on it anymore. Thank you for your help. We're going to get to it. This first one's long, uh, longer. And I think it's I think it's all relevant. So I'm going to read through it here. This comes from uh, Spindler Jr. Brad, probably Brad Jr. He says, Looking for thoughts on two things. One is a curiosity and the other is perhaps advice. Why do you think the buffer between Boston qualifying time and the buffer needed to get in has changed so dramatically from uh, 2021 to 24? 21 looks like it was the fastest year I could find with almost an eight minute gap. He makes the scrunchy emoji face. Then if you hit the BQ standard the next two years, even with 10K more runners entered, you get in. 2024 just was shy of a six-minute gap. Second part, I'm trying for a BQ next weekend in San Diego, and my block has been built at 305. Last marathon, I ran 315. I'm afraid 305 won't cut it. Debating on adjusting target finish time down to 302, which seems inconsequential as we all know. It's a two-parter, sorry. Uh, As we all know, a few seconds per mile does add up. That's so funny. We're just having this conversation, and here this is the first question. (laughs) I'm novice in all of this being my third marathon ever. 446 first marathon, 315 second marathon. That's a big improvement. Big's not even the right word, hour and a half. 16 weeks at 50 to 60 miles per week this block, so I might be overly optimistic thinking I can touch sub 302 to hit the buffer, but thought I'd ask your thoughts anyways. By the way, love the pod. Thank you educating all of us with the show it's a good one he's he's splitting hairs yeah all right preface 
The way Boston Marathon works is that there is a qualifying time for each age group that you must run to even be able to register. However, they only take X number of participants in and it goes off of times. So you may qualify but not run fast enough to even go. And that seems really, really unfair to people because for years, if you just hit your Boston qualifier, you're pretty much in. Yep. Uh, but this is the way the rest of the running world works. Uh, that's the way nationals works. That's the way world championship, Olympic. You can hit the Olympic trial standard. You can hit the Olympic standard and you may not get in because mm -hmm. there are other people who have done that and faster. So I guess – congratulations, you're now starting to deal with high-end running problems. That's pretty cool. Second is that if you went, all this aside, if you went an hour and a half faster from your first to your second, uh, you're not at your ceiling. So no, right. it's not crazy to think that you can cut another 10 minutes off or 15. Like you might go out and run 258. You never know because you are you have no clue what your ceiling is yet. In 15 weeks at 50 to 60 miles, that's pretty awesome. So that's my preface. Okay. Um, well, he asked, first of all, why do you feel like uh, the time standards have gotten so much harder to get in? Um, people are simply running faster and there's more of them, right? And so the roll down happens, just as you had said. Mm -hmm. um, and this was often the case, even back when we were in college, they'd have, you know, you had to meet the minimum requ requirements to potentially go to nationals and track. And maybe they took 16 guys in the mile and 18 hit the standard. So like two got cut, no big deal. Sometimes they had a hard time having a field that hit the standard, and there would be a roll down. Now, 100 guys in the NCAA hit the mile standard. They've been adjusting them, you know, so they're going down. Mm -hmm. And so it's happening to everybody. You're exactly right. So it's just like the world has leveled up. And I don't know what it was with the COVID years yes. and people going into like monk mode and just training instead of racing themselves into oblivion. Like, like people came out of COVID, the ones who took racing and running seriously, came out of COVID better for it on the run front across the board top end mm -hmm. pros to backyard betty running her local park run 5k's everybody did it was a it was a an outlet for common folks stuck at home and it was a a chance to train like a monster for the pros who didn't have to worry about the the circuit right so i think it all bled down right so that's like i think the overview do you have anything else to add to that that's that's it COVID allowed people to say, you know what? I've always said I should try this. I'm going to try it. Whether that meant starting, taking it more seriously, or going all in. And it coincided with the biggest jump in shoe technology improvement we've ever seen and the biggest jump in training availability yep. in terms of high-level training for the masses. And recently, AI has gotten to the point, which we showed on that episode, that they can write pretty darn good training plans. Mm -hmm. So accessibility, time, commitment, and shoe technology has all culminated to just level up the entire running world. And it's it's not yeah. fair by the old world standards, but those standards are going to get changed very quickly. And then it's going to get back down to, yeah, if you BQ, you're probably in again. Right. The BQ will just bump down They just had to minutes. change the Olympic standards. Why is that? Because everyone's running too fast. The Olympic standards are harder to hit than ever. Even the the International Olympic Committee had to adjust for what's happening now. So mm -hmm. the trickle downs there as well. It's just it's just a faster world than we grew up in. Yeah, that's true. Um, and and to piggyback that, and then we'll get to the specifics. Here is uh, you can literally go on YouTube right now and follow Clayton Young's build to the marathon. Uh, in a weekly YouTube series. They show him more in his quality sessions. The Lex and Leo Young Boys, as they were coming up on their YouTube, showed everything they did. The resources are out there. Instead of putting your shoes on and going like, I'm going to go for a jog today, somebody's like, I saw Lex and Leo do this workout. I'm going to go do that workout. And is that a training plan? No. But is it better than just putting your shoes on and winging it? Yep. And so you have just like an educated crowd mm -hmm. that has access to unlimited information and we're all in the 100%. YouTube rabbit holes. And so, yeah, so it all adds up. Anyways, that's the why, sir. Uh, he already ran his race. He said he had a race. Uh, this question came in late May. So this race is come and gone. So you're going to have to message us and see how you What's did. his name? Uh, his I'm going to look him up. I just deleted the, let me see. I got it in my deleted folder. That's how I check him off the list. His name, and I forget already full name is 
Hang with me, folks. Uh, Brad Spindler Jr. S P I N D L E R. So, I think. Uh, okay, I'm gonna look it up. I think Brad, what you do is you listen to Bracken's advice he gave me about six minutes ago, eight minutes ago, and you literally hopefully in hindsight can go back in time and listen to what Bracken's advice was for me in the half. You can make up time late, but if you blow up early, it's over. And so even though you took an hour and a half off of your first to second marathon, which is unbelievable, the expectation to have these huge time jumps is going to always be there, but that jump is going to get smaller and smaller as you go. And my guess is you got pretty serious about your training to the 315 and running 305 would be a stretch goal. Probably. I think you're going to run much faster, but I think right now, I think going out on pace, 305, and seeing what happens after that, after you get through 12 miles, then you can start to know if you can tighten the screws. And Bracken has a look on his face right now like he's seen the results and he's dying to tell me. And so I got to know, how did Brad do? What do you think he did? I think he ran 309. That's what I think. You do. What did you say you think he could do, though? I said I think even 305 would be quite a jump at this point, to be honest. It'd be a huge jump. 302.18. He ran 302.18. That a guy. 302.18. Dude, you don't need us. You got this. Congratulations. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, it is fantastic. Well, maybe you got your buffer there, Brad. <laughs> He's going to be right on the verge. And now I want to know, Brad, how did you pace it? Let's let message us and tell us what the splits trended and looked like. Did you take Bracken's <laughs> advice without knowing it? Do you want me to tell him? Oh my god. Go Do you ahead. Want me to tell you? Yes, tell me. What race was it? All right. Um I can't see right now. He started out at 649 pace through 5k. And uh, faded a little bit. Oh, so he went out on or about faster than pace. He went for it. Because mm -hmm. 652s is... I'm going to look up his Strava. 652s is uh, three flat, basically, I believe. So, three flat. So he did fade. Probably a painful race, but he did a great job. 302.41 according to this. Oh, my goodness. Come on, Strava. What is going on here? It's well, I think we got the gist. My login. He didn't negative split. That's all I need. That's all I needed to know. He ended up going for it in positive split, but still held on. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. All right. Yeah, 302. Here's the splits. He went out at 652. And then 655, 648, 53, 55, 54, 702, 53, 59, 7 flat, 48, 56, 49, 51, 7 flat, 53, 49, 59, 701, 04, 05, 18, 38. Came back with a 659, 641, 620. His last two miles are downhill a little bit, but he, he got off pace a little bit and then brought it back down. To, to go from 4.45 to uh, 3.02, I don't know what that time span is, but it uh, sounds pretty well executed. He fought for it. Yeah, that's crazy. He rallied. All right. I'll let you yeah. be my inspiration, Brad. Are you ready to move to the next one? So I guess that, that dispels all those notions I gave you. <laughs> Send it. So, all right. Screw Send it. Send it, Kirk. It's on Brad's shoulders now. Brad's... Uh, inspirational marathon. I mean, if you can do it for a marathon, you can send it for a half marathon, right? No problem. It's only half as far. Yeah. You can send it twice as hard. <laughs> I'm going out in 459 then. Might as well. By the way, I uploaded that in workout to Strava feeling like, okay, like uh, I'm happy that this this is out there. Like I'm I'm cool with this one today versus last week. So like, that was icky. And then I scroll down just a hair, and guess who did six by a mile that day? Who's also doing grandmas? Tyler German. What? Tyler? Did six by a mile with roughly the same rest. 
He closed in 434 for his sixth. His last three were in the 430s. Oof. So if you think I'm being yeah. braggart, folks, you are so wrong. I got humble pie five seconds after I uploaded my own workout, being like, there's a chance, and then I see somebody <laughs> run 20-plus seconds per mile average faster. All right. Uh, Cat well, Kirk, pitch. I did a run yesterday. Okay. On a semi-technical trail. Yeah. Semi. And trying trying to hold theoretical trail marathon effort on a technical trail that I want to run that an FKT on later. And I was targeting 930 pace. So there are there are all sorts of versions of fast out here in the world. You weren't on a track which is flat and round and good footing and you know this. I was happy about it. I'm happy. There's just many ways to feel fast or slow in this world. Yeah, that is the truth. You can compare yourself to anybody unless you're like, you know, cur. All right. Kat Vorkapich says, hey, guys, potential Q&A question. Do you have any insight or recommendations about training when recent blood work shows anemia? My super scientific Google research says anemia can take three to six months to resolve. So do I just train on as normal while taking iron supplements? Backstory. 45-year-old mom of three teenagers. I've been training for four to five years and compete in age group Spartan and DECA. I recently made a change in birth control, which caused a hormone domino effect causing anemia. The last two months of training, it felt awful. Fatigue, dizziness, high heart rate, and my running pace is getting worse and worse. So now that I know what's going on, what's the best way to approach training? I was hoping to run DecaFit late June and maybe West Virginia Spartan in August, but maybe not with this current downward trajectory. Thanks again for being awesome. Love the podcast. You're welcome. I have concrete thoughts on this out of the gates. And it also gives me a reason to shout out one of my athletes as well. Um, Take it. So I've been meaning to brag about her um, earlier this week, but I didn't get to it, we will call. This is a guest we had on our podcast two years ago, Bracken, Natasha Manzel. She's over in the UK. Mm -hmm. Natasha, I've been coaching Natasha for almost five full years. We've had a great relationship. She's never run further than a 50K, and she went out and ran 115 miles this weekend in a 24-hour trail race. (laughs) Took third overall. She dominated the field and she's running up and down the stairs today like nothing happened she's an absolute bouncy ball i don't know how she's in the shape she's in her sleep is fine anyways natasha congratulations 115 and we probably have her running 80 miles a week she's doing doubles twice a week she's doing split doubles once a training block which is every four weeks anyway she killed it now that's out of the way natasha cat we had such a low period two year and a half ago, two years ago, where her she kept feeling bad, feeling bad. I told her, Natasha, I said, you gotta get blood work done. Like you're running nine minute pace now on your recovery runs when you normally run seven thirty. Like you can't even do a quality session anymore. Like something is systemically wrong. And she went in and of course she was anemic as I suspected. And for months, Natasha, we're done with quality work. You're putting your shoes on. Her heart rate was through the roof. Her paces were minutes slower. Look at her now. She got it figured out. But point being, she was burying herself, trying to keep up with the training program, and she made it worse and worse and worse and felt worse and worse and worse about herself, and it got her absolutely nowhere. You are not going to see a return on your hard work right now. It's only going to make you literally like less healthy and feel less good. You need to put your hands in the air and you need to stop training hard. You can do recovery work all you want. It was literally just burying the knife in her every time she did that. And then she'd get worse and pay for it more and get worse and pay for it more. And I did respond to Kat in the messages briefly, but no quality work. And temper your expectations. Natasha had to go from 80 miles a week to 30. She had to go from you know, hard interval workouts to literally, for her, 10-minute pace. Not a joke. That's and she just and she's run a five k in seventeen oh like this is that would be nothing for her. And so my first advice is back way off. Second advice is you need to get the right help. 
you will come around so quickly once you get the right help, but you can't be burying yourself. Natasha went the iron infusion route, which she still gets checked every so often, six months or so. Natasha went from barely being able to run to within weeks being able to go back to full on training. She's like, oh my God, I went out and realized how deathly I felt because now I feel like a human again. It was affecting everything Mm -hmm. in her life. So you can supplement, of course, by taking oral pills, which are tough on the tummy. You can do all you need to do, but the pill route is so slow. Three to six months is right at best, and most likely your hormone imbalances are going to slow that down even more. So if you can get the right approval through whatever doctor you see to go in and actually get iron infusions, if you're that anemic, is going to turn your world around in weeks, probably. The pill form is going to take a long time. That's okay, but I still won't be like, oh, I took my first iron pill or ferritin pill today. I'm going to go hit my first hard workout. It's not going to help. So Mm-mm. I'm giving nope. you a, a specific story, but also like general recommendations, but that's where I want to start with that one. I think you start and finish there. There's nothing that needs to be added to that. That The closest the average person will ever come to feeling what uh, doping what using illegal drugs and training and racing would feel like would be going from anemic to non-anemic. Mm. It's superhero stuff. It, the, it is a life-altering change when you get things balanced out and leveled up. So do that. Yeah. Involve a doctor sooner than later. Like yesterday. And and iron, it's, it's an interesting. It helps oxygen basically bind and... Uh, be utilized by our body. You are literally in some sort of like oxygen deprivation when your iron is low. It's a bonding agent, right? Iron ferritin. And I don't know the specifics. There's going to be somebody out there that tells me I'm not exactly right, but it's an oxygen transport system, let's call it. And so like you literally are like lacking the proper fueling of oxygen to your systemic body and you just feel like crap all the time. It's it's the glue that brings it all around for you, let's call it, so you can actually get the, the proper transport. So you're, you won't win that battle. Like, you will not win a true anemia battle by, th- like, just, like, outworking it or outminding it. Like, your body's actually not functioning nearly as well as it can. So you need to get the levels up regardless. Can't will this one away. Agreed. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing I'll just bring up on this, because I get this question often, if an athlete's not feeling very good, and we've had this on the podcast, we've covered this years ago, but... Um, Blood work, man, if you're like, I just, you know, we have bad days and weeks, that's fine. But if it seems to be more of a theme, like you got to go in and get blood work done, get your iron and ferritin checked immediately, make sure your hormones are all in line, adrenal in particular, and then have your vitamin D levels checked. Like those three things, if you can just make sure those boxes are good, you can be like, okay, I'm tired from overtraining or I'm tired from bad sleep or life, but I'm not tired because I have something wrong in my body that I can't like fix. So I just think like going and getting blood work done yeah. is what you got to do. Yeah. Anything, Dad? Yeah, I'm on board with that. When do you, people ask when should I get testing done? Well, the moment you think you need it, or the moment you can't explain your symptoms away by rest, recovery, modulating volume, intensity, hmm. then you got to. Yeah, and you need to be a bully with doctors. Like even if you go in for excuse me for your, like your annual physical. They may not throw iron on there. They may check your liver enzymes and your other kidney markers and whatever, white red blood cell count. All that's going to show fine. You need to be like, hey, fine, I'll pay extra whatever, but I really want to get my vitamin D and my iron levels checked as well. Like, Because sometimes that's not included in standard blood testing. You think it would be, but it's not oftentimes. And so you have to request it. And you might have to pay for it. I don't know. But just make sure you like are very specific with that stuff because otherwise they may overlook it. We'll just do a general metabolic panel on you, and they'll miss things. So um, so yeah. I, actually, I actually have three questions left, so we can draw these out if we want because many of those took two screens, and I thought they were separate questions because okay. they were longer. So anyways, so we can, uh, if we have some time, we can bullshit at the end. But this comes from Tyler Ortega. Uh, question for the next Q&A. Now that I'm on a running public training plus strength plan, I'm curious what you recommend relative to fueling slash eating on days that you have a run and lift. 
I usually run either before work or at lunch, then lift after work, so I have some time for at least one meal. Ideally, I would like to maximize the recovery portion, but also fuel for the upcoming workout. Appreciate you guys. There's two ways of looking at this. The first way is to say, how do I best set myself up for success in the second one, the second workout? And the second way of looking at this is, how do I stress over this the least? And I don't know which type of person you are. There are some people who, if I focus on getting it done correctly, then I'm going to fuel correctly and my life's good. There are others that once I get used to doing it on X, I will never be able to do it if Y happens. Hmm. So I don't know which type of athlete you are. So my answer for one is just eat how you would normally eat. Make sure you're not hungry. Make sure you've drank enough and you're going to be fine. You can do it fasted in between. You can learn to do anything. So don't stress over it. Just fuel yourself after. Eat a sandwich. Eat a wrap. Have something like that. Have a cold hamburger. Ugh. Do anything Kirk would want you to do. Ugh. And I'll let you take the other side, how to do it like correctly and maximize your performance. If we were having a two truths and a lie episode of the Q&A, I think you would call what I'm about to say a lie, but it's not. We're not doing that today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> When it comes to maximum performance, timing of food is important. Timing of your caffeine is important, I think, as much as anything in my day and age. But the longer I do this, the more I think you have calories in your bucket. And if at the end of the day you're meeting your calorie requirements, whether you ate too much the night before but not a lot in between your two workouts, or you ate a huge lunch but hardly any at dinner because you didn't want it, or whenever it comes, I think if, you're, if your bucket got full – you met the demands of the day within a relative 24 to 48 hour period before and after. I don't think it's going to make a, a lick of difference what you do and eat before in between. You're going to eat, of course. You have eight hours or whatever your time gap is. Um, so you eat normally and you don't overthink it. And it's that simple. And as long as you're getting enough, you step back and you say, am I getting enough calories today for my demands? I don't care what you do between those workouts. I don't care at all, to be honest. Not at all. Zero. Again, if like it's a quality session in the evening and for some reason you lifted in the morning or, or you ran, there's some games you could play there with making sure your carbs are saturated for that top 1%, but I don't think it mm -hmm. matters. I really don't think it matters. W would you have thought I was lying? Hmm. I would say it is going a little bit against your your history mm -hmm. here to, to go that route, but I also agree with you. I think that the simplest way, and this isn't necessarily the most scientific route, but the simplest way to look at how do I fuel after workouts is just say, what did I use more of and mm -hmm. what do I need to recover from it? So did I run highly anaerobic? <laughs> I burned a lot of sugar. I burned a lot of carbs. Yeah. Have a bit of that. What do I need to recover from it? A bit of carbs, a bit of protein. Have a little bit of that. Make yourself a sandwich that has those two components in it. You're set. Have a smoothie that has that. You're set. Uh, the way our training plan is set up online is that the strength training is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, which coincides with our easy and recovery days on the running. Right. So on those days, the run's not taking much out of you. What did you use? Not a ton. Burned a little fat, burned a little carbs. Have a little bit. What do you need recovery from that? Not a ton. So you don't have to worry about it too much. It's when you do quality run, big lift, or big mm -hmm. lift, quality run, or long run, strength in the evening. Then it starts to matter a little bit more. But just think, what did I burn? What does my body need to get back to baseline or to improve from that? And that's, as, that's about as in-depth as I personally ever get. That's really good advice. The harder you work, the more carb ratio you're yeah. burning, and the easier you work, typically more fat stores, but carbs are always into the equation. Um, in fact, some people's systems mm -hmm. on an easy day can run on 30% carbs and 70% fat, and the same person running at the same relative yeah. effort could be burning 70% carbs and 30% fat. Our systems are also different that way, which you could get advanced testing and find out, but you brought up something that triggered a point in my head, and that is protein is terrible fuel which you said nothing about. 
Protein is terrible. a terrible fuel source, and people think they're doing themselves a service. They get done with their lift. They get their shaker bottle full of whey protein. They're like, I'm good. I'm recovered. De-de-de. No, that did nothing for your cellular energy. Yes, it will help you with long-term adaptation and, and repair to the muscle itself. Repair, that's the key word. As far as providing you energy for your next session, mm-hmm. zero. It has done nothing for you in the grand scheme of things compared to other fuel sources. So just because you had a run in the morning and then you know you have a lift in the afternoon and you eat four chicken breasts and two protein shakes and protein bars to think that that's how I'm going to be ready for my next session, you're literally up your butt upside down and backwards with how our bodies use fuel, period. So overloading protein because strength's in the equation, wrong. That does not prep you any better for your next training session. So just get that out of your head. Any of you that have that thinking like, I'm going to be recovered now because I ate protein. Wrong. Dead wrong. So I wanted to wedge that in there. Protein is important, but it's repair, not refueling. There. You said it better than I did in less words. You got it. Josiah Middow said something or posted something one time, and I've repeated it on here from time to time, and I'm going to say it again because this really matters on quality workout days and on double days. How hungry you are after a workout is an indication of how soon you need to eat, not how much you need to eat, which I think is a profound statement. It also Mm -hmm. might sound weird from us because we're always saying that most athletes underfuel, so eat more, eat more, eat more. Yes, we still believe in that. Mm -hmm. However, we don't have to 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 view our hunger pangs as signs of capacity that's missing. It's urgency that's missing. A lot of people do underfuel and they struggle with that, but there's also a lot of people who they start up a workout plan and it's permission to binge. It's permission to Mm -hmm. go and get your smoothie with the metrics added in and have uh, two burgers instead of one because I'm working hard and I need it. I'm super hungry after my easy run. No, you're super hungry because you you need food now, not because you need a gallon of smoothie or a a dump truck full of, of chicken. It's urgency, not quantity. And I experienced that. So in the gym with clients, like a hunger will hit me and I'm like, I got two hours till I can eat a meal. Like I need to eat. Like I'm so hungry, but I don't have time. I'm back to back for hours straight. Mm -hmm. I grab a bar, which there could be arguments for better choices, 250 measly calories. And I'm not satisfied after it's done. I'm like, I want more, but five minutes back to training and my body calms down. My blood sugar has risen and I'm not hungry at all anymore. It's proof that like if I could have, I would have eaten 1500 calories. If I could have, but I didn't, I ate 250 and I'm just as happy yeah. and not tired like I would be if I had a big meal and then be like lethargic mm-hmm. afterwards. So I experience that almost daily and it's true. Just eat, let it sit. Yep. You're right. You ever experience that? Every day when I'm making dinner, every single day, I am suddenly starving as I start to prep dinner and I'm snacking the whole time. Like I, I'm going to need a double dinner. I'm going to eat all I want here and then I'm going to mm-hmm. eat dinner and then I'm going to be fine. And then I finally sit down and it's been like 30 minutes since I started. It's like, huh. no, I was just really hungry. I ruined it. <laughs> and now that, that hunger is sated. Mm-hmm. I don't need more, but I ate crap. <laughs> like I was just <laughs> dipping chips in guac, not crap, but like I was eating chips and guac while I was doing this rather than waiting for the meal and mm-hmm. happens all the time to me. Yeah, I always grab a nice fat, feel like crap. fat stack of Pringles. I cannot resist while I'm hungry and waiting. And I just shouldn't buy them, but there they are. It's terrible. We got Pringles this week, which made me think uh, Mira loves chips. And it flashed me back to your wedding weekend when uh, Mira was devouring all of your Doritos. <laughs> she was. Standing in your kitchen, wearing no clothes, just <laughs> shoulder deep. In your Doritos bag. Yeah, I walk into my kitchen and your daughter's there, butt naked. I don't think an article of clothing on her. And she was actually shoulders deep Not, in a family. They just come out of the lake. <laughs> family size bag of nacho cheese Doritos. And she's standing there without any care in the world. She didn't care that she was naked when I walked in. She didn't care that she had a handful of Doritos. She didn't care that she had orange fingers and an entire face. She just was living her best life. I aspire for that. Mm-hmm. And for the new listeners, this is my youngest child, just so we're clear. <laughs> He's, what, four and a half at the time? <laughs> Not your teenage so, daughter that you don't have? All I right. just... 
correct. The size of a person in which would be shoulder deep into a bag of Doritos. That's all. You can figure the age range there. Yes. <laughs> all right. Um, Chris uh, John says, or Jan, uh, hey, guys, Q&A question. Can you elaborate on time on feet, i.e., how much work can I move from running to bike and still get enough? And how effective is walking, standing, elliptical versus running? Okay. This is a good question. We haven't touched upon it recently, and I'm going to refer to two other people as well. Both Ryland Schadig, who we've had on this podcast, and Dylan Scott, who we have not, but we need to, have made posts about this this year, about how cycling has been so important and rowing for Dylan for his overall running game and improvements. And they are both high volume, low running mileage athletes. Dylan runs more mileage. He'll, he, he'll hit some 50, 60 mile a week stuff, but he is huge volume on the machines, bike and row in particular. And they've both made posts about how powerful it is for their running. And they've also both made posts about how, but you can't just expect to go on there and dawdle and get any better. Mm. And both points, I think, are are needed here. Triathlon, multi-sport, uh, mountain runners have shown that you can move to other modalities of exercise and be a great runner. But you do have to work. You can't just dawdle. You can go out for a run and dawdle, and you can get better as a runner. You can't dawdle on a bike and get much better. You don't have to hammer, but you have to work with purpose. You have to go on there with a plan. You can't just turn on a show and lose your mind. You have mm -hmm. to work on cadence and work on a power zone you're going to stay in. And that is one piece that I think is missed the most often is people sometimes forget that they have to work a little harder on the bike than you would on the run to get some benefits. You have to mentally work harder to get the benefits is kind of the key word in my yes. opinion. You can go out for an easy run and suddenly your heart rate's getting away from you and you're like, shoot, my heart rate's too high and I'm just running easy, I swear. And then you get on the rower and you go easy and you're like, my heart rate's not going anywhere today. What the heck? And you got to choose yep. to engage with the implement, right? It's the biggest thing, especially spin bikes. Oh my yeah. God. The, uh, the amount of mental effort spin that needs bikes, to yeah. be put in to get your heart rate to go anywhere and then to stay anywhere takes intent not just like perceived effort it's a liar to you on the bikes and the and the machines and spin bikes are difficult on your quads when you're not accustomed to them they're tiring yeah and you don't think you should be working that hard and that's probably right early on but you still have to be honest you can't move the resistance until you feel nothing in your legs i'm just turning my legs over just getting my heart moving it's not the same as just turning your legs over running it's not never will be it does take a buy-in period to get good enough at the bike or the rower to be able to mm -hmm. work just casually aerobically without a high muscular cost but you just have to pay that cost up front yeah and then the other side of the coin, he's talking about the running side of the coin. How much running do I need to do or how much can I replace with? Um, you're going to see gigantic jumps if you're at least running three days a week. I see the biggest jump from three to four, and then I see diminishing returns, but still returns from four to five, five to six. Six to seven, I think, is kind of a waste of time. So... Step one is make sure if you're healthy enough to hit that three marker. You can build half a career off of three days of running if it's in combination with the right cross training in between for the aerobic stimulus. If you can get to four, better. But we need to just make sure we stay in touch with the mechanics we plan on using in a race and the systems we plan on using in a race while running. You can supplement it unless there's a unique injury case, right? Where I can't push off hard or my calves bother me or whatever Correct. it is. So there's, there's exceptions to the rule, but my first thing is like minimum three days. If you're going to call yourself a runner and actually get somewhere with it, three days is a must. Four days, you're going to see a huge bump because it requires mm -hmm. you to what? Run back to back days once a week. That's huge. And then the rest can be filled. If you're yep. up to four days a week of running, the rest can be filled with recovery work on the cross, on cross training, but, but recovery work doesn't mean again RPE recovery work. It means like, am I getting my heart rate into the one thirties like I would on a recovery run? If not, I got to dig in and make you know I actually mentally engage. I can't just watch YouTube and check out and my heart rate sits at one hundred five. That's not going to cut it. So correct with giving you some info but not all the details. That would be a, an add on to what you'd said. Yeah, yeah. Three days a week running is kind of required to improve as a runner. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are cases of people doing it on two, 
but they have exceptional circumstances. But somewhere between three and five days per week is the sweet spot for most people, especially if you're doing big volume on other machines. Mm -hmm. Anything above that is just bonus. Anything below that is going to keep you from getting towards your ceiling. I'll pose a question to you. The whole, I'm too tired today to run, I'm going to bike. That's not when you choose the bike. It is harder to bike than to run on an easy day. It's I'm too beat up to run. I will bike. Yes, that's when you bike. I can't take more impact, but I have energy. Yes. I'm too tired? (laughs) Go dawdle on a run then or power hike. (laughs) Don't get on a machine if it's because you're low energy. You you won't get anything out of it. You won't get your heart rate above 100. You'll sit there and be just wasting your time. Um, you're, you're dropping some knowledge bombs today, and I wanted to add something to that, and now I lost it. Oh, I wanted to pose a question to you, just to get your, your thoughts on this, since we have just a little time to play with. Talking cross-training and running, would you prefer athlete A, three run days a week, 50 miles a week, no, 40 miles a week and three runs, okay? A really big long run, and every time they put their running shoes on, like, they're putting time in. Or do you think a five-day-a-week, 30-mile athlete would end up better off? So three days a week, 40 miles, or five days a week. Let's even call it 35 miles. So less mileage but more frequent exposure. What do you think would end Five up- at 35. But not at 30? You weren't convinced? 30 is almost, yeah, th- depending on the athlete. Yeah, because then are you getting a long run? Are you getting quality work in that's useful? I'm not sure. Uh, three runs for 40 is high volume running. Mm-hmm. And my worry is that the impact will catch up with you. Even though you get more rest in between, you're just not, you're doing a lot. Could it be done? Of course. I'm and saying what's going to. People gonna- do that, but. <clears throat> Let's say you're racing an hour-long race. It's a 60-minute race, 10K to half marathon. What's going to what's gonna yield you the better result? Like what the same athlete. Athlete A is athlete B, just on two different experimental programs. Because I've been athlete A where I've almost hit 40 in three because it seemed like ex- re- exposure, back-to-back days of running what cost me, but not how much I ran every time I put my shoes on. And I built some really good fitness then. And so I, I don't know what the better answer I'm is. I'm going to say the longer the race is, the more I'm going to lean towards three runs that are all big. And you better be purposeful with cross training. Yep. For a shorter race, 10K or under probably, I'm going to choose five runs with 35 miles per week and still have to do a cross training. Yep. But at some point, you need the big run. This is assuming injury risk is not on the table. Give me three 13 mile runs or a 15 and a a 13 and a 12 or whatever it's going to end up being. And let me just build big running and be purposeful with my other. I think that's what I would do. Um, But a new runner, I'm absolutely going to put on frequency rather than duration. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with everything you said there. I think short races, you're going to want to. That's a tough one. It is. And when I was doing three a week, three day runs a week, I had two hour trail races on the docket. Like I was like, if I'm gonna put my shoes on, I'm gonna go run. Yeah. And so I think it was the right decision then. But if I had a five K on the track, no, I'd be spreading them out for sure. So I agree with you. I just mm-hmm. I got curious. Um, all right. This is the last one we got. Uh Nathan Ritchie says, uh appreciated your episode on running in heat and humidity. Question for the future QA. In the heat and humidity episode, you mentioned metrics going out the window. Also, how it's important to train in conditions comparable to the race if you expect to race in the heat. What if you train in really high heat and humidity, but will be racing in cooler weather? I can focus on my improvement in quality workouts while still understanding my paces will improve come race, <clears throat> race day. But how can I know what goal race pace I'm prepared for when the conditions are so different? Thanks. I wish I knew numbers for this. What numbers? What is cold? Like what? In what is the temperature is going to hit, and what pace are we talking? 
Is this a 5K in 20 degrees? Is this a marathon in 50? Well, I, I just want to know what they're talking about. Uh, I believe there are two types of people. There are those that can just do just fine in the cold and those that really struggle with the cold. Yeah. The good thing is you can always put on more clothes. He's saying cooler temp, so I think he's referring to summer. My guess is he is, or at least some people listening are in the boat of, I run after work and I do it. I don't need to be a morning person. I run in the heat of, at 530 at night. It is still almost heat of the day. And I run in the heat, but my races are going to be in the morning mm-hmm. and it's going to be 20 degrees cooler. How do I gauge expectations now, knowing I have this trump card in my hand that I'm going to race and it's going to be cooler? Like, what can I expect? I, I would guess that's the situation. Or he runs midday. His job allows it over lunch yeah. or whatever, you know? And then I'm expecting to be cooler weather. What coming down from altitude, in quotes, gains can I get by racing cooler? Yeah. I feel like that's what I, he's he's asking. Well, yeah, that makes sense. There are a few ways to do this, and I would probably do all of them. The first is you can use an online calculator, like the VO2 Max calculator now has advanced features that you can type in altitude or temperature. Uh, I don't know if you can do humidity or not, but then you can put <laughs> your performance in right now, and then you could put in a perform that same performance and change what the temperature was and see what the differentiation is. Uh, mm-hmm. You can go online to these race point calculators. I think NCAA might have one. Uh, I uh, The Track and Field Federation might have one. Um, anyways, go on those and, and play around with their temperature-based scoring charts and then also do a test um find equivalent treadmills and do one like in your garage like if you had a someone with a garage treadmill do that and then go somewhere temperature controlled and do the same exact time trial or workout or tempo run or whatever and see what your differences are so i would start to get a little like combination of as many ways as i could go about thinking about how much faster should i be as the temperature drops but i don't know if i have necessarily one good way of predicting for you since everyone reacts to it a little differently i think it was jack bauer but it could have been somebody else after i ran fifteen seventeen in uh, 89 to 91 degree heat with like i don't know a thousand percent humidity and he sent me some metric from a calculator saying it was equate to like a 1450 if the conditions were ideal or something like that. So mm-hmm. I know those exist. And he made me feel better about it. Um, yeah. I'm going to say five seconds a mile. Just blank. Does it feel cooler to you? Great. You just earned five seconds a mile. Does it feel hot to you? Too bad. <laughs> You're just going to have to add on five seconds a mile. I don't care what the swing is. I find it somewhere in that range. Ten maybe in extreme cases. No matter the distance. I don't care. Like five seconds a mile, feel cool to you? Good, run faster. I can give you five seconds and you're not going to be misfiring. Feel really hot? Go at five seconds yeah. per mile slower. You're not going to be misfiring too much that way either. That's what I've noticed. Five seconds goes a long ways if you're really dialed. So if you want like a tangible, uh, completely unvetted answer, I would say five seconds a mile. There you go. Start there. Mm-hmm. What do you think of that? Is that enough? Is it too much? Is it too general? Certainly not too much. Yeah. I think five to 10 seconds per mile probably is a good range to estimate. And also the duration. The longer the race, uh, the more heat impacts it. I have run, in college, I ran, I think four times, maybe five my senior year, I ran within a half second of the same time in the mile or the 1500 meter. And one was like 40 and rainy and one was like 90 and windy and one was like 80 with 100% humidity. I ran basically the same in all of it because it's four minutes. Mm -hmm. doesn't really matter. It's over. The longer your race goes, the more that cooling or body temperature matters and the more it's affected by it. So the bigger the the bigger the distance, then the bigger the impact, and the slower you're gonna have to go out. Or th- conversely, the faster you can go because you don't have to worry about the cooling factor as much. So, goal distance does really play into it. I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent because we got like five minutes or so. Okay. Um, we talk about pacing as like oh we can just choose like I'm just gonna choose to run five minutes per mile faster. I'm gonna choose to go out in five thirty pace. I'm going to choose to run five twenty pace in my half marathon. And I think three quarters of the people listening to us are like, how do you choose? How do you know? Like, get it that exact? Mm-hmm. Are you kidding me? Like you're talking another language that I don't speak. 
Like I go out and think I run 830 and I run a 745 and then I, my race is screwed. Like how do you, what do you do to do that? Like, are you just lying to us about how consistent or dialed you are? Or is that possible? And I just want to get on my soapbox and say it is possible. And if you don't think it's possible, you're using your watch completely incorrectly. That's it. If you want to get dialed in on pacing, if you have a Garmin or a Sunto, you start your run and it's on your average pace screen and you scroll down to get your lap pace screen. And that lap pace screen will tell you exactly what you're trajecting to come through the mile on or a kilometer if you live somewhere else. And you live and die by that thing. You should be so in touch. Like if I were racing next weekend and I see 535 pace and that's my goal, I know I sit right there and sit still. And I don't, I don't miss it all because I check my watch every 30 seconds if it's that important to make sure that I'm right where I need to be. Don't just start your watch and guess. That is, we are beyond that. It's 2024. Your watch will tell you exactly what you're projecting to come through your mile in. So use the lap function, the lap pace screen, which is a look into the future into what you're going to come through the mile at that effort. So... The current pace is all over the place with the foliage on the trails. GPS loses, reconnects, but over the mile, it'll average itself out. What is foliage? Foliage, sorry. You understand what I'm saying. Is it like aluminum for Brits? Yeah, are they both accepted? You knock it off. You knock that off right now, Bracken. No, it's a genuine question. We have aluminum, they have aluminum. Me and my growing are going to go not to tolerate (laughs) this. I'm not a hunter. I didn't know if in the hunting community it's called foliage. <laughs> foliage. No, it's not. You're picking this, on I'm me. not being sarcastic. This is genuine. You're genuine able. No. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think? Oh, goodness. What do you think of the lap? Like, you can nail it. It's not that hard. And, I'm, and you can get mad at me for saying that. It's not hard to nail pacing with your lap screen up if you're running within yourself. No. Tell me your thoughts on that. I am 50% a hundred percent of the way on board with you. So I am a hundred percent on board with the 50% that said everyone can learn this. The human body is kind of made to be a metronome. It gets really dialed into the environment that it's in and to the repetition behaviors that it's around. You can get to the point where you can predict anything. You can guess what time it is. Look at your watch and be pretty darn close. You can guess the temperature. You can, there's a whole bunch of things like being at the racetrack, listening to these people, the people who know racing, they come back up, your mixture is a little lean. Oh, you're running rich today. They just hear it. They know it. They can predict it. They can guess tire uh, temperature after 10 laps on the track, depending on what you started at. They just, whatever you're around, you become dialed into that, Mm -hmm. but you have to be seeking it. You have to be looking for it and being aware of it. And so I agree. You look at your watch constantly. The part I disagree with Hmm. vehemently is that I only use current pace. What? I almost never, ever look at lap pace. But GPS signals are accurate and then inaccurate and then catch up down when the trees aren't there. And you got to look at your average trajected pace. You look at current pace. and And I think that's all part of the game. I think it's all part of the game. You look at it and you say, yep, or you say, nah, I don't buy it. And then you make your own guess, and that helps you su- circle in closer to your own perceived effort. I, I just stay on that, and I either use it to confirm how I feel, or I say, nope, I'm faster than that. If you're going to go out and, and say- And that's what I do. But okay, listen this goes to me. back- No, stop stopping you. If somebody says, Bracken, I'm going to pay you a million dollars to go run 530 anything, 530 for one mile. You can run much faster than that. You can run slower than that. What screen are you pulling up on your watch to make sure you run 530? You're not telling me you're pulling up your current pace screen. No way. Yeah. You're going to, I'll have a million dollars. Yeah, I mean, what I'm really doing for a million is I'm I'm getting on the track and I'm just using chrono. (laughs) I'm, I'm, I'm hitting 530 on the head. No problem. I'm going to have to be a millionaire. You're going to be broke. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, you have to practice it. <laughs> I've told this before, but in at Campbell University down in North Carolina, my freshman year of college, we only had like four routes we ran, and we had the mile markers spray painted on the road. Mm-hmm. And none of us wore GPS. Well, one guy had a GPS watch, and it was so trash back in 2005. Mm-hmm. And the rest of us just had Timex stopwatches, and we would play the game every single time 
we'd as we get close we'd all predict what we're running and then we'd hit split as we get there and we'd see how close we could get and at the beginning of the year we were playing with 10 second spreads and at the end of the year we were playing with tenths that Love was it. a 623.8 nah that was a 623.1 so i'm like that's a 622.9 and people would be like whoa mm-hmm. lay off the sauce there guy like well, that's how dialed in we got in just a year one year of playing that game every single day. That's what I did with heart rate when I started heart rate strapped. You look down every few seconds. You guess what it mm-hmm. is, you look down. You guess what it is, you look down. And eventually you just know. You're not wrong. I 100% agree with you 100% of the way on that. I support my man. But I just don't think people are that in touch <laughs> in general. The gen pop is not no as in touch. They're not. Yeah. Well, we can arm wrestle over this one day then. But they can be. They can be practice it <laughs> we gotta go you got cart stuff to take care of i got a wedding to go we to. do is there anything you'd like to wrap you with said something i wanted to say something about and then i lost it what were we talking about prior to this because we got in a fight oh, i had a question for you if you could only choose one thing and i don't remember what it is i was I would, gonna reverse the tables on you i would choose you bracken Oh, and IU. Okay. Darn it. This is... Oh, it's going to drive me crazy. So, you know, some some people are smart and some people aren't. They lose it easily. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to remember this the moment we get off of here. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have... All right, a- that's it. <laughs> I'm just going to go out with a whimper. Fizzle on out. Fade into the music. Here it is.